Hello, uh, my name is uh, Freddy Montero. Uh, I'm an architect with uh, the container uh, practice at Red Hat. <clears throat> How many of you guys buy stuff online, especially from uh, Best Buy? Anyone? <laughs> hands, hands. How many of you guys check the tracking of your packages going at UPS.com? Of course, that tracking comes to um, the OpenShift clusters that we have at UPS. Uh, what we're going to be talking about today is going to be our journey of doing software, more or less, OpenShift upgrades without any downtime. And this is going from uh, OpenShift 3.4 to OpenShift 3.11 and beyond. Uh, with me, I have uh, Kevin Chang. He is the, uh, the lead uh, technical uh, guru at UPS that handles the team that manages all of the uh, OpenShift uh, cl uh, clusters. Kevin. Good afternoon. Hi, my name is Kevin Chang, and I work for UPS, and our team is pretty much responsible for the infrastructure, support, and design for OpenShift at UPS. So today, we're going to be talking about, let's go over the agenda. Um, so UPS, who we are, what we do, um, also the background, and also our journey, like Freddie mentioned, our journey with OpenShift, how we started, and why we pick, uh, why we pick UP, um, OpenShift. And also with the monthly um, open, uh, operating system uh, patching, and also the um, upgrade path from 3.4 to 3.9, and now from 3.9 to 3.11. And some of the lessons uh, we learned along the way, and uh, finally the accomplishment and uh, roadmap. UPS, what do we do? What can Brown do for you? So as you can see on this slide, most of you think, hey, UPS, we ship packages. There's a lot more than what we do, than shipping package. So, um, so as you can see on the left-hand side, we have the global small package service. That's what you guys, uh, most people are familiar with. So we have the domestic package, and we have the global, um, we have the, um, Global, global package services. So on the right-hand side um, are the additional services that we provide. So for example, supply chain, uh, su supply chain and freight, and logis uh, logistics, UPS freight, and UPS capital, like insurance and um, finance, uh, financials. Um, so some of the interesting facts that, that I found along the way were how many packages cars do we have? So today, um, we have about over 100 and 123,000 package cars all around the world. Um, we have about 150,000 uh, storefronts all around the world, and 200, uh, over 200 air, uh, aircrafts. Okay. So Brad, uh, our background with OpenShift. We started with OpenShift in 2017, beginning of 2017, and we had selected some of the most mission critical application to, um, to be on OpenShift. So for example, some of the uh, tracking, some of the network planning uh, for, for the routes and everything. Um, so these are mission critical applications and no, out, no outage, no downtime for, mission, uh, for OpenShift. Um, um, so how we accomplished this, what we did was we used uh, some of the Red Hat tools um, that, can, um, um, that can migrate the existing infrastructure without any incident. And last year, we had also won the Red Hat Innovation Award in 2018. Okay, the journey. How we started, why we went this path. So traditionally, we started with um, when a, when a developer, um, when an application comes, come, um, need, needs to get some work done, what they first do is they, they take their, um, they, application teams develop their, the develop, developers take their uh, code and develop their, uh, in their laptops. And then eventually they would take that code and hand it off to the operation teams. Operation teams would then schedule jobs, uh, I'm sorry, uh, make a change, a request change controls, schedule jobs to put, put, the, put the code into, into a development environment and then eventually put it in the UAT environment and stress environment, eventually in production. And during the whole process, if something was to go wrong, the the, if something was to go wrong, the operation would go back to the developer and then back and forth. A lot of times we're wasted. So that's when we started looking into, hey, how can we make that better? 
And that's where the DevOps uh, model had helped us tremendous, tremendously. So as you can see on the right side of the graph, we have the whole DevOps model. I mean, the developer will still do their development work in their laptop. That's, don't, that, that didn't change. The difference is that once, you're, once their code is done developing, what they would do is ship it off to a Git repository. And with the right configuration, when a, when a code is updated, it would automatically push into the development environment. And they, they can start doing their testing, and if all is good, with a push of a button, essentially that code get pushed to, push to, to the next environment, which is stress, and then another with a push of a button, it gets pushed to production. And in the middle of the process, if something was to go wrong, they can control, they, they have full control of pushing the button, hey, I want to roll back to the previous version, I want to go back to the development environment, they have full control over it. So operation teams don't have to get involved whatsoever. So what are some of the benefits that, um, that, that this provides, right? So create, modify, and rapid deployment. Faster time to market, and also automation with uh, uh, less errors. Whenever you do automation, there's less error, less hu human intervention. Um, application team built for um, operating operations um, and eliminate need for uh, hands off operations. So why did we pick uh, Red Hat OpenShift? So prior to Red Hat OpenShift, actually today we still have it. So whenever, whenever we um, we have many different environments, right? So for the .NETs, we have the Windows, we have the Windows platform. For the Java environment, we have BA WebLogic or WebSphere. So all of these are separate environments that operation teams need to support. One of the biggest advantage with OpenShift is that with OpenShift, you can have multiple different languages all hosted in one single common environment. And which also provides many, many of the features, like for example, the high availability, Noisy neighbor, which means that, which means that, hey, if one of the application develop, uh, one of the application to uh, develop bad code, it won't because of the Docker, it won't, it, it won't impact any applica uh, other application that's sitting on the platform. And the next part is the application team controls operation tasks. So essentially, operation operation team control their full, uh, their own destiny. Right? They can scale up pods when they have, when, when they have uh, more traffic coming to their environment. Um, they can monitor their own CPU and say, hey, do I need more, uh, tra uh, do I need more pods for, for their environment? And then um, they can also uh, uh, self-help uh, persistent storage requests. And then lastly, the application portability. They develop whatever they have on their, develop, uh, on their laptop. It can port be ported over to any environment that they want. Okay, monthly OS patch. So one of, one of our um, mandates from our security team is that we have to be patching every single month. And during, so for, for, and the, for the patches, it covers the kernel patches, the security configuration, and some of the custom configuration that the, the OS team, that, um, the, the, from, from the OS team. So with having over, so in our environment, we have about over 400, 400 servers for the OpenShift environment, uh, 14 OpenShift clusters, and it requires no outage. How do we do it? So by doing, so what we did was uh, we create our own Ansible scripts, and once the Ansible scripts is created, we would execute through the Ansible tower. So I'll just give you a high level of how uh, the Ansible script looks like, how, how, does it, um, how does the path looks. So from a, from a single server perspective, we would essentially, t um, hold on. Okay, so, so from a single per a server perspective, we would have a pre-task. So prior to starting any, uh, any patch, first thing first, you have to check to ensure that, hey, the environment is fully operational. Once, once we deem that the, the, the script will determine the environment fully operation, once the, the environment is operation, then we can start looking, hey, the first task is we're gonna take whatever server that we're gonna be working on and then coordinate, oh, oh, I'm sorry, take a step back, we're gonna make sure that that server is 100%, also 100% operational, and then we're gonna coordinate. Essentially, it's taking it out of the, taking it out of the mix, taking it out uh, so that there's no, there's no traffic going to it. 
And then once that's done, then the patching begins for that particular server. So in the middle of the, in, in the all the way on the right hand side where, hey, the patch actually starts and then it will do all the configuration change, it'll do the kernel updates, and then finally it'll do a server reboot. And the last piece is it'll check, hey, did, 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 the, oper um, did the OS patch cause any problems? And if, if all is successful, it will put, put everything back in the mix. So that's from a single server, so that's from a single server patch view. So how does Ansible Tower play in this whole picture? What Ansible Tower does for us is it does the scheduling. So as you may know that, hey, with OpenShift, it, everything is broken. Things are broken down to master nodes, infra nodes, and application nodes. So what we do is, using the capability of Tower, we schedule that, hey, when we do the patching, the master server, will, we will do ma one master server at a time in event that if there is a failure in, in any one of the master servers that we have, it will stop the job, everything gets stopped until ma and, and manual intervention will have to come in and see what happened, fix the problem, and then kick off the script again, it will continue out to, to the point where we stopped. And then also it goes the same for the infra infrastructure because it's a front door, it's, it's a front door to open ship. Um, we also do it one server at a time in event that if there's, again, if, the, if there's any failures, manual intervention has to come and fix the issue and then move on. Where, where it gets better is the application nodes. We have multiple application nodes and then there's some concurrency that we can happen over there. So we, can, we, we group everything, application nodes, into six maintenance groups. So each maintenance group can have like 10, 10 servers at once and then we can have 10 concurrent servers being patched at once. And then lastly, we also have the metrics nodes. So how do we do, um, how do we upgrade from 3.4 to 3.9? With, th with the upgrade of 3.4 to 3.9, there is an etcd upgrade, which that means that essentially it's, we're, we're forced to have an outage. We have to bring down the data, etcd database and, and upgrade, the, uh, upgrade the etcd database. In order to avoid outage, essentially what we did was did the blue-green blue deployment, which that means is, hey, if we, we have two clusters, one is, on the 3.4 and it's servicing existing customers and then 3.9 environment which will be the new build and then we'll have two pipelines and one is the 3.4 type uh, pipeline that would deploy that can deploy code out to the existing environment and the other uh, the other pipeline is for the 3.9 so once all the testing is completed for the 3.9 environment essentially the application team will just do a DNS failover so so we have multiple application teams. They can, they have full control of when we give, we give the application team a timeline. Two weeks, hey, during that two weeks, you have to, you have to fail over to the new, um, I'm sorry, DNS switch over to the new, uh, to the new environment. Three point nine to the three point eleven. We are currently doing that today. Over the past weekend, we just completed one of the, our production environment. So, how do we do it? So, we had to create again. We have to create our Ansible script. There's a lot of customizations that we have to do to um, to make to ensure that everything is happening correctly. So, what are some of the customization that we do? So, for example, the the host name has to be in the right format that OpenShift requires, um, the proxy settings that we have, and configuration and log location, because from 3.9 to 3.11, there's a major shift in everything becomes a pod. So even for the infrastructure, uh, even for uh, what we had before was the, um, the RPM base, everything becomes uh, a pod format. So all of that is uh, to ensure that everything is copathetic is we had to, uh, we had created a script to make that happen. And once that's done, we have, then we start using the uh, Red Hat out of the box um, playbooks. Um, again, everything is divided into, um, we have the um, control plane, and then, and which that has the master nodes, and then um, also it's broken down to the uh, infra nodes and then app nodes. Again, master nodes, we're doing one at a time, and infra nodes, one at a time, and app nodes, we can do it concurrently to save, to save a lot of time. And then lastly, once the, once the environment is upgraded to 3.11, 
we would have our, um, we, we create the post Ansible playbook that we use to uh, ensure that everything is running at this exact same manner for a different cluster. So for, and also a lot of customization again comes in play where uh, performance customization, router customizations and um, application logging and time sync, for example, uh, et, et cetera. What are some of the lessons learned that we learned from upgrading from 3.4 or actually be on OpenShift in general? Um, the top two is more of, I guess it's learning curves, um, skill sets. So I'll just read it off, hey, op open, uh, open ship skill gaps uh, to design, implement, and support the infrastructure as a short period of time. So as you may know, OpenShift, it's not just, hey, you can just learn OpenShift and, and that's it. With OpenShift, there's so many different components. You have the networking, you have, um, you have uh, Ansible, that you, uh, Ansible, you have the RHEL OS. There's so many different components. And, and in order to be successful uh, with deploying OpenShift, you have to have expertise in so many different areas. So that's what uh, a lot of challenges that we saw uh, that, that we encountered. Hey, you have one person that's uh, good in one area but not good in the other. So we had to learn a lot from, hey, every different area, we kind of have to start learning how everything works in order when, when we encounter problems, we can, um, we can resolve it in a, in a quick manner. Um, the third one um, is uh, resource planning is critical. Today we have one full-time myself and two consultants. Um, we need to, um, we, we're, we're looking at increasing our resources to be able to, to, be able to um, support our existing infrastructure. Um, from a technical side, we have a HA proxy router. So one of the big things that we, we ran into was after we deployed a 3.4 uh, environment, and we had, all, uh, we had all the applications team on one, uh, one cluster. And what we got was that periodically we would have application team come to us and go, hey, we're getting some drops and we're getting some times out or some requests are taking longer. And then later on, later on we realized that, hey, HA proxy is a single process, single threaded uh, process. So what that means is that, hey, granted we created multiple physical servers for HA proxy to sit on, for the pod to sit on. However, being that it's a single process, it will only use one out of 56 cores that, that we have allocated. So the resolution for that is we, we started creating more, uh, multiple pods on each single servers so that, we can, uh, we, uh, so that the process can be utilized on, on the particular box uh, more efficiently. And then um, custom role reset permission, with the upgrade of 3.9 uh, 3 or 3.11, there are some custom rules that we have to go back and revisit and work with the app team to make sure that um, the custom rule uh, fulfills their, their requirement. And um, OpenShift uninstall job did not clean up um, directories. One of the things that we do at UPS is we would, so for example, if we were to upgrade to a different version, we would reuse some of the application nodes. And the uninstall, what we learned was that the uninstall doesn't always clean everything up. So what we have to do is we have to manually go into each server and make sure that everything is cleaned up correctly. And lastly, performance save mode. Um, essentially, it's a, it's a flag that you turn on and off that, hey, if it's, um, if it's turned on, meaning that, hey, if the server is not being utilized heavily, it will start shutting things down or it will, it, it will start shutting things down and make, um, it, it had caused problem for us, so we had turned that off. Okay, accomplishment and roadmap. 2017, we started with OpenShift. We built out the 3.4 infrastructure. 2018, we started onboarding a lot more applications. And then we, again, we built out the infrastructure and then we upgraded from 3.4 to 3.9. And through 2019 to 2020, we're in the process of upgrading 3.9 to 3.11. Again, we're, we're onboarding additional applications coming onto OpenShift. And um, at, towards the middle or end of this year, we'll, we want to start evaluating the 4.x environment, uh, 4.x release, and then building out, um, ex, uh, building out infrastructure for capacity uh, expansion, and monitoring um, Grafana and per, uh, per, uh, using Grafana and Prometheus. 
And then finally, further, for further automation with Ansible. And that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you.